old pond, frog jumps, splash of water. And so he was a um, Buddhist priest. He had trained in Zen. So it has that immediacy of being present, being intimate, and also it's that splash of enlightenment. And so I named the farm Old Frog Pond Farm. And a few years ago, I made a frog, which later you can walk down and see in the middle of the lower pond there in bronze. And the frog's name is Splash. <laughs> It's a great intro. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I'm Laura Davis, and um, I am a NOFA uh, employee, as well as I'm an organic inspector, and I'm coordinating the TOP program, for which this program is being supported by the USDA uh, Transition to Organic Partnership Program. And Linda is a mentor for the program, and we have a mentee who Our is mentees are working here. with uh, Linda, a very lucky soul, who is also growing fruit. So welcome. And um, anybody that's looking for a, uh, to be a certified organic farmer can join and we'll be matching more mentors in September. Uh, I want to mention that if uh, we have two other sponsors besides the USDA, uh, one is Microbiometer. Microbiometer is a little kit that you can have on your farm. If you don't have somebody like Melissa around with a microscope, you can actually um, do your own test and see what your fungal to bacteria ratio is. Fun little kit. Um, also, Trillium Accounting is another sponsor of ours. So we're going to get started, and um, we thought it would be fun um, if you saw sort of the beginning and the end of over a 10-year period of what Li Linda's farm has been able to accomplish. When you're sort of an organic, the expectation is that you are working on constant improvement of your soil, right? Because when you have constant improvement in your soil fertility, you have more production, more um, nutrition in your food, less insects and less disease. And the way that a certifier and others will measure that product, that improvement is through a couple of the things on this soil test. So we gave you the 2014 and the 2024, which is really very interesting. And Linda can kind of talk about as we go through what it was that she did. Um, this is a soil test analysis, which I do for NOFA generally, and um, what I noticed, if, if you don't know what total exchange capacity is, that's the ability of the soil to hold on to those major minerals. Um, we like to see that over 10. Linda improved it from 8 all the way up, up, up over 10 over the years. And the other big metric that we look at is organic matter. She moved that from six, uh, sorry, 6 sorry, 6.9 to over 10% organic matter. So what that means for her and the soil here is that every percentage point of organic matter gives, um, Mother Nature delivers 15 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So if you do the math, 10 times 15, anybody? 150 pounds of nitrogen she has. So she doesn't have to supplement with any nitrogen, which is great. Most of us do that have uh, low organic matters. It also holds 20,000 gallons of water per percentage point. So I don't, you probably didn't have any puddles in the orchard last year, did you? No, but we also have Hinkley soils, which is very rocky soil. So it does drain quickly. Some of the orchard is towards the back and it's lower and it is, um, there is a little bit more water back there. We did not irrigate once last year. There you go. <laughs> and that is with very rocky soils. So, um, yeah, I think that's really important to have that organic matter up there. That's right. So if you get a soil test, make sure if you get it through UMass to ask them to do organic matter. It's a really important metric for you to start as a baseline and then uh, track as you are growing in your, in your homesteads or your gardens or your farms. That's great. Um, <clears throat> so maybe you can talk a little bit uh, before we start our tour around the farm 
about what your normal fertility practice is. So we love planting other plants in the orchard. I'm an artist. Um, I think most growers, fruit growers, gardeners, vegetable growers are also have that aesthetic. And I do know from seeing charts, I remember there were some tests in Australia where they were growing like wheat by itself and then wheat with some other plant and then wheat with some other plant and yet another plant. And the wheat was like going larger and bolder and more beautiful with each successive additional crop. So I think that that is truly important, is not to have a monoculture, which when you're growing fruit trees, you can tend to. So we're very aware of that. Um, there is a downside that we learned where we had most beautiful wildflowers all between our trees. We didn't mow it in the fall. And it was a very snowy winter, which maybe we won't have again. But the snow was over every single fruit tree. Like I remember Franklin Carlson told me, Franklin Carlson is like the, he, he died last year. And kind of the godfather around here of apples, commercial apples, not organic, um, but a wonderful, wonderful man. And he said, if he, plants a tree like and doesn't put that hardware cloth around the trunk he like can feel his father's like fury <laughs> rising that you need to do that to protect the tree from voles but with that snowy year and all our beautiful foliage they all went along the top crust of the snow, dropped inside the hardware cloth cage, and ate around the trees. And we lost, oh, 50 trees maybe? Um, we lost a lot. So now we mow everything down. So we're putting perennials out there, but late fall we mow everything down. So just that caution about how you're, you know, managing is specifically an orchard, because you need to mow it down so that the raptors will come swooping in and <laughs> pick up some of those voles, because of course we're not putting poison out for them, which is standard practice um, in a commercial orchard. So we are adding a little nitrogen, we have been, for our young trees. The, the soil isn't, they just need it. They need a boost. I can tell the difference. We have a field over there where we grow apples, and um, it's just, it's not rocky. And um, I'm sure the organic matter down there, it was, a sh it was sheep were there before I even moved here, which was 20 years ago, over 20 years ago. Um, but trees just shoot up there, whereas in the big orchard, they, they really struggle to get established. So I do feed them uh, an organic fertilizer, like a 534, um, when, not when we plant. We never fertilize when we plant, but that next year. I don't want to, you know, you want that, the root system. You don't want to, like, tell them, oh, here's a bunch of nitrogen so you can grow quickly. Like, you want them to actually develop their root system and, you know, establish themselves before. It's like, you'll see we have young trees out there that are in bloom, like are covered in flowers. I'm like, no, no, we have to <laughs> remove every flower because they're just too precocious. And we want them to be growing, not producing at that age. Because once a tree kind of flips into production, it changes it. There's something different. And then you don't get that same growth. So, yeah, I mean, there's so much to share with you. <laughs> but So we do use some nitrogen. We have been doing soil tests. 
not recently every year, maybe every other year, because I, I kind of know what it is. But we first started in 2006. So 2014, it's almost another decade back um, that the changes. And then we were... Um, we did go through a period where we were really trying to isolate and add very particular, even micronutrients, cobalt or, you know, manganese. Now I find, and I think that our, um, those um, micronutrients, micro, the minerals, we're getting from seaweed. We put seaweed in every one of our foliar sprays, no matter what. And I just think that is just, it's, it's just, you know, such a like a light, nice dose of so much. Because seaweed has, I don't know, 120. Yeah. Where do you get your seaweed from? So we um, buy it as a powder. So we're not paying shipping. I mean, I'm always for powder. And we get it from a place... You can get it from other places. We buy it from Organic Approach, which is one of the um, places in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, somehow I got his name, Eric Morgan, early, early on when I was just starting. And I would have these long conversations with him, and I didn't know anything. And we were ordering, and I was spraying, like, you know, more sprays and shipping stuff up. But I'm, like minimizing you know i i belong to an apple group like an iconoclast apple growers group that meets and we meet once a year for 24 hours and everybody is like bringing something to it of what they're trying but when i went to that first meeting this is one that michael phillips you probably most of you know his books he's like another godfather of growing apples um as people went around the room, one man quietly said, he's trying to get rid of his tractor. I was like, oh, yeah, get rid of your tractor. You know, it was like I had just, of course, gotten from a Wesco <laughs> a used Rears 300-gallon sprayer. Because that was, like, essential. Like, I was told, if you're going to do this, you have to spray. Like, there's, there's pests. There's 300 and some pests. For apples right out there <laughs> um, so we've been actually doing less doing less uh, amendment amending doing less spraying and kind of trusting more so that's where the direction that I feel we should go and um, like plants like watching and seeing where does the plant want to grow rather than I want the plant to grow here? So we have nettles, patches of nettles in the orchard under certain trees. If we need to, we'll cut them down in the fall for pickers. But, you know, I'm like, okay, that's wonderful. We have mountain mint that we have, especially, well, out there, but also in the berry patch, which you'll see which is a great pollinating plant. It's, yeah, if any of you want some mountain mint, yeah. Isa has some all ready to go, right? It, was, it just spreads. And it's the last plant to bloom in the fall. And every pollinator that's alive, it's like the smorgasbord of pollinators on top of it. So it is beautiful. Is that uh, see? We, see, I just want to mention if you don't want to um, fool around with all of the micronutrients, you know, boron and manganese and all of those. Seaweed is a really good overall um, great foliar spray, and everybody knows what foliar means, right? Spraying on the leaves, liquid type of mineral. Okay. How do you make sure that with the, all those other plants? that that's not too much and that you're increasing fungal activity and I don't know, harboring insects and um, we, the young trees, but for us it's mainly thinking of um, we, we weed around the young trees and 
you'll see we're mulching around the young trees. We'll put cardboard and wood chips um, so that they don't have to fight. You know, they're not in competition. Um, we have a lot of daffodils because we love having daffodils out there. And also we're thinking, oh, well, maybe that will, you know, keep some of the pests away and some of the moles and voles. And, um, but just around the young ones, where like we have a buffer zone. We try to. It doesn't always happen, and sometimes the trees get taken over by weeds and we can't get to them all, but we definitely try. The, a plant, from our experience here, grows better when it has some room. Like even a tomato plant, when it has a little more room, it seems to just be larger and uh, fill that space and there's more nutrients for that plant so um, I think that's helpful but it is a balance yeah so um, we were bringing bees in and um, then there was a, a, a point where I don't know I think that we didn't bring bees or maybe just one high I can't even remember now and I realized we have so much pollinator food everywhere that we have so many pollinating insects that actually if we didn't have bees I think we would be fine but we do have two beehives and Issa and Kevin are in charge of them and love the bees and they did our two hives wintered over this winter so we're very happy and they're they're like filling the hives with honey and they're multiplying so we love them are they actually pollinating the apple trees when the orchard is filled with dandelions i don't know i mean yes some but you know in a in a in a non-organic orchard they would be ridding the orchard of dandelions because for apple blossoms the bee has to go down in like it takes longer to get the nectar instead of just like floating on top and you know they and so they're not the best pollinating insect but I think if you have plenty of other, and especially if you can plant for the full season, then you can really, your, your property can manage to hold and, and sustain enough pollinators. Because, you know, it's not just the honeybee, it's ants, it's wasps, even birds. Like, there's, everything is pollinating. It's wild, right? And the bees won't come out when it's rainy. They won't come out if it's chilly. So <laughs> they are a little particular. They're adorable with their little pockets full of pollen. And, you know, like I love seeing one like perched on the blossom and like holding on kind of and like kind of reach in there and... But, uh, yeah, so I think we have plenty. Because actually, well, it's not that big. There's some 400 trees. And I think, except for the fact that we have some 60 different varieties or something. I don't know. We don't, I don't, we don't know the count at the moment. But, um, which means that the blossoming is at different times. Otherwise, I think they, what we, it could be one day. And the whole thing. I mean, it's miraculous how quickly, given how many blossoms are on a tree. It's totally miraculous. <laughs> yeah. Spring, when the ground is frozen, we mow them down completely. And if you're going to grow raspberries, a lot of them, that is the way to go. If you're, you know, the other, otherwise, your summer raspberries are fruiting on their second year canes. 
So you kind of have to go through and get rid of the ones that have already fruited and leave the ones that haven't. And that would be a very time-consuming project. It's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> this patch was all raspberries. And now we've changed it over to four rows of blueberries, grapes with some pawpaws, uh, asparagus, two rows, and rhubarb. So it's the perennial area. Um, mostly the spotted wing drosophila is what moved us to lessen the rows of full raspberries. So how many of you know about the spotted wing drosophila? <laughs> bad, bad pest. So it's a pest that came in, I think it was 2012, something around there. It was came to California, and then it moved across the country. Um, blueberry growers uh, in the Midwest encountered it, finally came here and moved up. And it's a fruit fly that lays eggs in unripe fruit. Unlike every other fruit fly that just loves the rotting fruit, like you put peaches on your counter and they start to rot and the fruit flies come. Out of nowhere they come, right? Like where were they? They would lay their eggs in unripe fruit and then as the fruit ripened, be like mush. So it was really, it's a very tough um, insect to deal with because they reproduce so quickly. Like you turn around, like, and how many sprays are you going to do? And if you're spraying some kind of toxic poison, you're going to be spraying it like every five days or so. It's hard to deal with it, but we would just could not get rid of all the raspberries. So we mostly, it's about hygiene. And it's about, um, we pick the fruit as soon as it's ripe and we pick anything that our pickers, it's pick your own, don't pick. We get it out of here. And that's a big job and that's why we only have four rows. Um, it's a very unconventional way to grow raspberries. We happen to love growing raspberries this way because usually they're like, up between wires and kind of fenced in and held up. But they all, they kind of grow up and they support themselves. And so then we can just mow them down. Um, What's their maximum height? Um, they can be taller than I am. One season. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess they're so expensive. And like, we don't want to be spraying something like that on, um, on them. Yeah. Yeah, so um, there's not too much. Air circulation is really important. Health. So John Kempf, whom a lot of you know, I remember early, early on, that's what gave me hope, was it was like in a UMass auditorium, like years and years ago, when he was like doing his first early talk. And he talked about the blueberries that he, and he showed this chart which many of you have seen, the chart of the insects and plant health and how there's different insects that are more challenging for a plant to deal with. And so that the spotted wing drosophila, he said, you know, it's not like a beetle. It's not like the plum curculio that we have to deal with in the orchard. It's, it's a, you know, kind of self-bodied insect. And if that plant is healthy enough, it should be able to... So we haven't quite gotten there, but maybe we actually are... are it is influencing. The health of our plants means that we're able to do this. Because I don't know, like, almost every other, like big pick your own raspberries people have just mowed them down a place in winchester um and just said you know like we can't do this so that's the raspberries they do grow up sometimes if it's that they're really like just voluptuous they start to like fill the aisles and we will put some lines to kind of hold them back
bacteria, in particular it spread now from bees and other pollinators that are going from flower to flower and tree to tree and it gets in so it's systemic and the, you'll notice once the blossoms have fallen and you have leaves you see the little crook right at the end of a branch that's all you have to see and you know I need to remove it and so we go through the orchard every two weeks, every other week at least, depending on how much we remove. And you cut, if you see it here, you know, you cut, you give it a space it's that, that much. You want to cut down below it. And you leave a stub, an ugly stub. And you leave that stub so that you don't get it into the, the where there's other branches coming out and spreading and so in the winter that's why you prune in the winter one of the reasons is that the tree is dormant so nothing is moving and so that's the time we can prune and then it will heal over but you leave a good stub well you need real copper like not like Quava, like not so just... Even use a badge next to I don't know that. Yeah. I mean, what you have to do is like for all everyone, when you're using these materials, you really have to read the labels carefully. And you have to then figure out, oh, it says copper, but you might see it's 5% copper. So if it's a powder that's a dry flowable meaning it can go into a spray, spray tank that's 80 percent copper versus five percent copper that is a huge difference so you need to read your labels they're always available online to know exactly what's in there and what it's saying and it will give you a list for apples usually it's under Pum fruits for apples, for um, vegetables, or it will say for alfalfa, for everything, and it will be different amounts per acre. And then for smaller gardens, often like there's different formulations. Regalia is a product I like. It's a fungicide, a biofungicide. But there is a, it's like you can buy it in a gallon container regalia CP or something that um, on its label it's telling like for smaller um, amounts like tablespoons per gallon whereas the other one the two and a half gallon container is telling you like how many gallons per acre so it's you have to learn how to figure that but you need as you when you're putting amendments like some boron might be 30 percent boron some might be 15 percent boron and you can't calculate how much to put on unless you know what you're doing because in that 50 pound bag if it's 15 percent boron then you're only whatever it is the math eight percent or something how often do you apply and how do you avoid Once. Applying. Can you avoid it or? Well, last year was a bad fire blight year. So I did not avoid it this year and sprayed the full amount. And you saw we're high on copper. Uh, generally, the certifiers will look at organic uh, copper in the cell. They don't want you to go too much over. Um, so this is a golden, delicious tree you see no flowers it is in biennial production it had a bumper crop all these are golden delicious a bumper crop last year so no apples this year and it's really hard to keep they have their they have a propensity for going into this biennial production so it's varietal 
there's sprays you can do, especially if you're thinning with chemical sprays. It's so much easier to drop enough flower or small fruit so this doesn't happen. But of course we're not doing that. And um, I guess we're just allowing it. You know, like there are some, could spray lime sulfur. That would, that would do it. And I just kind of abhor it. It's very, Caustic, yeah, exactly. It's supposed to be very effective as a fungicide if necessary. Like it has right. kickback. Yeah. So called, meaning if you haven't put on your scab spray, scab is a fungal disease that apples get before a rainy period, then you could spray lime sulfur and kick back, meaning it will take care of it. Um, my recommendation to any of you who are starting an orchard, buy scab resistant trees. <laughs> Most of our orchard is now scab resistant. And I took out the max, which was very hard, but the max are scab magnets. And so it's like, how many times in a ra especially a rainy spring, are we going to spray? And also, max drop their apples as soon as they're ripe. Like Labor Day, they're dropping their apples on the ground. We can't get pick your own. Like no one's thinking of apple picking on Labor Day. So they'd all be on the ground. So we did, and now I have one row in the very front of Mac Free that we grafted. And I just wanted to show you this tree is a tree that I have a particular relationship with because I'm writing a book and this tree is, it is in the voice of this golden delicious tree who has a lower branch and they also have an orchardist and they, their orchardist calls that her bench and they have conversations and at one, in one conversation, we talked about the pink tree that this Golden Delicious can see from the top. And I was talking about how it's an Almada, it's red fleshed. Well, how did it come here? Well, I grafted it onto. So the tree asked to be grafted. So the other day, I came out and I started grafting all these red fleshed, here's Almada. Um, here's Cherry Crush. These are all red fleshed apples from friends who have Appaloosa, um, Mountain Rose. And so this tree someday will have red leaves and red apples mixed with their yellow apples. So that is, like, you can do that. You can have fun. Maybe we will have, yes, yes. Um, biennial issue, right? Does that mean they're all growing yellow delicious or? It could be. There's certain varieties that really are prone. But everything else, but everything else there is not in biennial. Liberty is a disease, cab resistant apple. It's a good apple and every year, no problem. Um, Honeycrisp is, is a good apple and uh, everyone loves Honeycrisps and so no problem. At all. We try. Yeah, but 
Yeah, That's like how good. many hours can you do it? <laughs> we actually hand thin these yeah. in such last a small year. Window yeah. of time, just a matter of weeks. Really. Right, you can you can have a bigger window to actually thin out the fruit, so your fruit will size up better. But it there's it's a shorter window because apples set; they decide their buds. They decide what apples in July for the following. That's before they've even matured their apples. They've decided, all right, I'm carrying plenty enough so that I don't have to worry about my legacy in the world and I'm going to rest next year. So there are, there's something called like blossom return or, who? yeah, I don't know if you've heard of that. There's, yeah, there are some sprays that, um, yeah, like you pick your battles. <laughs> Let them be. <laughs> I mean, because they're biennial, but it doesn't mean they have nothing on the off year. It's just okay. well, these this year actually have nothing. No, there's one here. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> yes. You know, um, Asian pears. This was one of the Asian pears, and when it fruited, it had these huge, big pears. I mean, beautiful pears. It was incredible. And I waited, and then finally I picked them, but they never ripened. And they never ripened. And then next, the next year I, like, waited to pick them till later, and they still didn't ripen, and they were still terrible. Like, you, inedible. It's like, this is so, A, it wasn't an Asian pear, and B, it was an inedible pear. So a, num a few years ago, just to test, you can see over here, this was, I cut off this branch and grafted. You can see these. These branches have been fruiting for a couple years. They're full of flowers, see? You can see the little Asian pear growing. See that? <laughs> so then the next year I did these here but oops see this see this yeah. and this that I don't know if I can cut through those are are coming out of the main trunk that's the so that's the actual unwanted so we'll actually get rid of them because you do want more light and then my um, plan is here so you collect cyan wood this is all my cyan wood. In the winter, when your tree is dormant, and you collect first year growth. So you can see on all these, um, let me see if I can, it's one year growth. You can always tell on any fruit tree. Here, so see this green? That's actually from here to here is last year. So this is second year. Um, no, this must be this year's growth. Yeah, this is this year. That's kind of crazy. I don't know. So here, look, yeah. Okay. This is what grew from my w little piece of cyan wood last year. From here... So, your cyan wood is what you gather first year growth in the dormant season. Keep it till now when the sap is flowing and you get maximum growth. And so you, in mid-May, is a perfect time to graft. So we are going to, I, I cut this, I've never done that, cut it ahead um, yesterday. Um, so this is all, whoa, these buds are even you starting. You do keep it in the refrigerator, and I keep it in plastic, and I put like a, like a wet rag in there, keep some moisture in there. And I don't want to use the very end because it will be dry, and I'll probably cut it about here, say. So I'm going to... Sorry, I, 
usually have a belt on. That, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut an angle. So this is probably the easiest kind of grafting. Yeah. Anyway, so you can see what I'm doing here, making a an angle cut slowly. Um, And then I'm going to cut into the bark. And then in a day, it's already outside. I was wondering about it's already less. It's dried some. So, what I'm separating, trying to, might have to cut down lower, saw it lower is the cambium layer, right? Cambium layer is simply this one little layer between the bark and all the void inside. It's only two cells thick. That's where all everything goes, all that juice. So we need to match the cambium layer of the little twig flush to the cambium layer in here. And you would normally cut that on the same day, Linda? Yeah, I think it's it's already, yeah, it's dried out a little. So usually it's fine, but I, you see how I can peel it back? I don't know if any of you want to come closer and see, you'll see. Like with the knife, you can... When you just cut it, it see how it, it opens? So then you can actually put your, your cyan wood right down in there. Is that the branches grow over the cut section. So it's all protecting that open wound you might say. So I need to make sure there's a bud. Actually, I like two buds, but that'll be fine. We'll leave two buds, right? And then I'm going to do the same here and same here. Um, and then I'm going to dab this. I'm going to tie this. Um, it is... The question is, what is the material that I'm going to dab? And it's, it's this non-organic, probably, latex a little bit, I think. You could... It was on your list. It was, it was okay. Yeah. Whatever it was. Um, it's... Um, just you could use wax. You could use, you just want to, you don't want, so I'm going to dab it on the end and I'm going to cover here. You don't want this to dry out. You don't want this wood to dry out, right? You want all that energy to, this is meeting there, to come up and these little buds are just waiting to receive and shoot out. And then what's the, t what kind of tape is that? Is it just hold it? So there are several tapes. Um, this is a tape that someone gave me, which is kind of cool, that's stretchy, yeah. that you actually is it parasol? seals to itself. But it's probably more expensive. And I don't know that it's this this is what like I was first showed what to use and I just tie it around and knot it. I mean it stays. Should you if you're gonna top work, basically do you remove all the branches? And the answer is no. You leave a couple big branches, which I had this 
I had this. Which was the original? That was the first one first that was done. But you want to, you need the nurse, the nurse branches. Okay. So that you have a root system that's big. So you want to still feed it. So with a couple nurse branches out for the seat, for the full se one full season, leave them. And then the next season, take them off. Because these little branches are getting plenty, right? Is this paraffin? <laughs> so I'm putting tension on it. <laughs> and that one stretches too. Kind of yeah, like it does. Floral paper, something like that. I don't know. I think I don't know nylon tape. It's easier when it's a flat surface, not this that sort of, then like I, you see how it, it's pulling? So I'm just going to tie it off. It's amazing though how long this stuff stays. I was just going to ask that, how, uh, how long do you keep those on before you remove the grafting supplements? Um, what I was told, the question was, how long do you keep all this stuff on? And um, you keep it on as long as it stays on. And I, not sure I have a brush. <laughs> So I'm going to use my fingers. Berries hydroponically, and that they are considered organic. How does that? Yeah. So um, it's a huge uh, controversial debate in the organic industry um, because. Soil is like every other word in the organic rex, <laughs> right? That was the basis of the right. Originally. But the um, yeah, you are a project. Are you real organic project? Real organic project. Real. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the real organic project was an offshoot of this problem with the NLP saying that hydroponic could be certified. Um, and real organic project farm certified, which Linda is one. My farm is one. Um, that means that not only are we organically certified through the USDA, but we also grow on soil. These blueberry farms that are growing are uh, putting down landscape fabric, having big, you know, uh, three-gallon buckets, using some sort of a medium with core and maybe a little potting soil, and planting blueberry bushes. And so they're not necessarily in real soil. And they are taking away business from large blueberry farms that are... Um, grow in, uh, in soil. So um, personally, I, I think of it sort of like a petition uh, by certifying with the Real Organic Project saying that, you know, NLP has to recognize that it's really important that we're growing in soil. And that's what the original reg said. They can't compete. That's the real sad part. The If you're growing in soil and the way you're picking and all the care and the taxes on the land. I mean, just everything. It takes a while to get that blueberry plant to where it's ready to go. But um, and, and right now, you have no way of knowing when you're buying in a grocery store if that organic strawberry is uh, grown in soil or not. Um, all, mostly all of your skulls are hydroponically grown. Is the Real Organic Podcast associated with the Real Organic Yes, podcast? yes, yeah. They've got some great speeches on there to catch that. Linda, in your orchard, what different types of soil amendments do you use with any regularity? You had said nitrogen, generally a boron. How many uh, different soil amendments do we use? Um, we do our fertilizer. Um, we do some sopomag, sulfur, magnesium, potassium. 
Um, so sulfur, we're low. If you saw my sample, we're always low. I'm told it leaches out. So the Sopo Mag is good. It's inexpensive. And so I use that. I've used others, you know, over the years. Um, we have some solubor. I need to, I need some boron, but I'm actually thinking of foliar spraying it. We had a conversation, I, like I read in a book that it's, I can't even remember which way it was. So John Kampf, who uh, is the visionary at Advancing Eco Agriculture, who I follow, a lot of people follow, um, he has 10 years of experience testing the sap in plants and knows what they've applied in terms of boron, manganese, zinc, copper. And he does believe that boron and some zinc actually show up in the plant when it's used in the soil as an amendment. But he really sees it in the plant sap if it's foliar sprayed. So actually if you foliar spray, you can use a lot less it gets into the leaves, and actually those, if you did a sap analysis, it would show a, a bump in those traces. Whereas, I mean, you've probably been adding soluble for a long time, right? I know I've been adding it in my field for 13 years, and it barely ever moves. Yeah. <laughs> so the foliar is what I think actually brings the boron levels up. And all of our soils are low in boron. I haven't seen a, one single test that has the right amount. We're all, we're all short. Would you use calcium as a foliar spray as well at any time? I read that the calcium is necessary for the fruit production itself. You could use any type of uh, anything that you're deficient on, you could use in a foliar spray. If it, yeah. But would you voluntarily add calcium as a foliar spray even if your soil didn't necessitate? I usually only use what I'm deficient in because everything else may go away, wash away, or whatever. Do you have your foliage testing? Uh, do I have the... the foliage. Yes. Yeah. I have done that uh, because I had trouble with beet sizing up. So I sent the leaves in, old leaves, new leaves, into AEA, which is the Advancing Eco Agriculture. And then they uh, tell you, they give you recipes, like, well, you're missing boron, you're missing um, iron, and you're missing, you don't have enough phosphorus. So they put together a recipe, had me spray it. I sent the leaves back for a second testing. And I use the exact same recipe for the last five years, and it works every time. Now, I don't send it in every, I don't send the leaves in. I haven't since the first time. But now I know how to grow beets on my soil. <laughs> so. you apples, have you done it? Only a few times. When do you collect them? Maybe July. I think sum summertime it would be the the right time. Um, and the lab will tell you too what they want in old, mm -hmm. how many old, how many new leaves they want you to collect. Mm -hmm. It is the time to do foliar sprays. Well, a you don't want to harm the pollinators, so you're either early morning and you could close the beehive the night before early, early morning, um, or late in the day. I don't think you want blaring hot sun, you know. Um, you don't want to see that it's going to rain the next day. It'll just wash off. Um, if you're spraying dormant oil, you're spraying without leaves a dormant tree, but you're spraying for scale, right, that is in the bark. So that's all you care about. If you're feeding, like nutrition, you need leaves, right? Um, and the more leaf, the more the tree is going to absorb. So it would be more beneficial to wait a little bit so those leaves are bigger. Um, I feel very... Um, I don't like spraying when we have blossoms. People do all the time. I don't because I just... And the bees are obviously there. 
you know, the tree is like, this is such a big time to have these blossoms out that like everything is focused on the blossom. Let them just like be. And at petal fall is a very typical time for orchardists to spray. And at petal fall is the one time I use a, um, a bioinsecticide. And if it's well-timed, it will knock down a lot of the, the caterpillars and that. So I do that. And I, I will use one and trust spray this at its lowest amount, but I'll do that this year again. You know, I'd like to get away from that too, beside it being a fortune <laughs> to buy it. Um, so it, it really depends. I think, does that answer kind of your, yeah. And then just a quick follow up. Just on the surface of the leaves, are you being particular about feeding from the underside or a tooth play? So the question is like, how are you directing your spray? So we have a tractor and we have a, it's down under the house. I don't know if you've seen it, a big tank. It's 300 gallons that we pull. It's an air blast sprayer. We pull behind the tractor and it just sends out this like big coral fan of spray. And it has four or five sprayers and they're set at different openings like the low ones don't send out as much spray as that top ones and so you're really spraying to the point of runoff meaning it drips off so you're really coating the leaves like if you're spraying for scab you want to coat that leaf surface like if you're spraying sulfur for scab Sulfur is organic. I mean, in Mesopotamia, ancient Mesopotamia, it was used as a fungicide. You're actually changing the pH of your leaf surface. So it's inhospitable when that spore is released. The scab spores overwinter in the, under the tree. And a rainy period is what releases them. And they float up and they land on the leaf and if the leaf is very hospitable then they grow if the leaf has sulfur on it or some other material that renders it inhospitable it doesn't develop but that's where scab starts out developing on the leaf very tiny little smoky spots you hardly can see it, but it's there. It will then jump to the fruit. So you need to coat your leaves. A standard soil test will tell you what's in the savings account, right? Uh, what's there for the future. Not necessarily what's available to the tree or the plant. If you want to know what's available to the plant, you can do a saturated paste test, but just know that it's only, you know, good. If that's your checking account, right? That's what's available right away to the tree. Um, or you could do a leaf test where you send the leaves in and have the sap analyzed, and they will tell you even more clearly what it's missing, what's deficient. So it's, it might be helpful, you know, to do that. And it wouldn't do it all the time, of course. I mean, some growers who are very, very large do it regularly because they're worried, you know, it's a huge crash crop for them. But um, it, it might be interesting since you've been there three years now to do that at least once to see, you know, to see what's missing. That's so critical is there's three pillars to soil health. Chemistry, which is... Calcium and all of those things we're talking about on the soil test. Um, and then there's the physical aspects of soil. You want to make sure it's not compacted. And um, most importantly is the biology. So you can grow a really great crop with biology, even if your minerals are not there. But you can't do the opposite. <laughs> so uh, 
Um, that's really important. So the biology is really important. And so that microbiometer, which is a sponsor of, the, of uh, some of our workshops, is a really great way to have that little kid at home and test or, you know, have send it in to NOVA and Melissa can uh, count your, bi your microbes and give you a report back. So important because those microbes, those little farmers, as I like to call them, eat organic matter, they, they eat the, the nutrients, and then they poop it out. And that's what is available to the plants. Without those guys, we're not going to be ha having a productive uh, um, crop. I also just wanted to add one thing, which is we spray compost teas. And we'll use nettles and comfrey and equisetum, horsetail equisetum, for the silica. And we'll brew it for 48 hours or a little longer even, and then mix that in the spray tank. And so, you know, it's a different way of getting, probably unscientifically, so nutrition and biology. Yeah, absolutely. And don't you sometimes put worm castings in yeah. there? What else do you put in? Any? Yeah. So, you know, there is that appeal of being self-sufficient, not bringing in inputs, not buying. You know, I, I'm pretty aware of how much we're spending. Like, you could just buy so much you need this someone brings up something oh i better get some of that i yeah and how successful are those so does it get rid of scab um question about scab and scab resistant there there are no scab resistant rootstocks they're scab resistant varieties so that's the difference yeah maybe you, there are some rootstocks that are less might be less susceptible. I usually only hear like rootstocks that are can less likely to get fire blight or. But, but are you still spraying those? Like, do you still need to spray those, even though there's spray We're not really spraying. We haven't sprayed one spray yet for scab this season. <laughs> Living a little dangerously, <laughs> <laughs> but it hasn't. You know, you watch and. The way those spores are released, it takes temperature and rainy period. And so if it's still cool, you're just not going to get as much. So if it sort of becomes humid and hot and I realize, okay, we're going to get like 70% of the release. Like I'll get, I get emails from UMass weekly. And I mean, like the depth of precision <laughs> is mind boggling, but you know, there's cougar models and I mean, it's just so complicated, all these different models, but it's in truth. And Michael Phillips goes into this in his book. That's where I started um, cutting back on my scab sprays that, you know, those early ones are getting like 3% scab release or five percent and so you know i just like don't worry about it and wait till it's a lot um yeah and there's also other products like serenade you can use for scab so you know sulfur serenade regalia um and i like mixing a little bit of different ones because i think they're all they have to be coming at it differently Right, because each of these different fungicides, biofungicides, is a different bacteria. Yeah.